Hi, everybody. Welcome to the QB School. I am JT O'Sullivan. Today, we are talking about creating your own play calling sheet. How does it happen? How do you do it? How do things fit together? Why are you doing it certain ways? We are breaking all of that down. Fired up for this one. Let's get into it. Welcome to the QB School. So before we get going, just a quick reminder, we have revamped, relaunched the Quarterback School Patreon community. If you've ever wanted to be part of that community, and really what it is, is it's a group of people trying to take their football to the next level, really an environment, what it's like in an NFL quarterback room, deep dives, all sorts of detail, nuance about the quarterback position, high level offense. If you're interested in that, I think you would absolutely love the Quarterback School Patreon community. You can find the link in the description of this video. Get over there, check it out, join. I appreciate it. As for this one, question. The question comes from Twitter. Hey man, recently discovered your channel and have been loving it. It has taught me a ton of stuff and I just accepted my first teaching coaching job here in Georgia. Congrats. So I'm all in on learning everything I can to get better. My question is, and sorry if you've already touched on this, could you do a video possibly on the best way to start creating a playbook or a call sheet for game days? I know the latter is more game specific and opponent specific, so it might be tough. Honestly, any tips for a first year coach play caller would be appreciated. Thanks again, Bryce Bonner. Bryce, outstanding questions there, lots there. Really things that could take you know years to necessarily digest when you start getting into the playbook element of it. For me, uh, anecdotally, I'll give you kind of the condensed, pseudo condensed version of what that looks like. I essentially was creating my playbook that I used as a coach at the high school level, essentially thinking about it my entire life, different ways that we would structure things and fit together the communication, the language of it, the hybrid nature of necessarily what it is. And at the end of the day, you know, it's available for everyone now. Uh, it's a course, I call it the JTO, but really it's just a framework for how I think offense can be run at the absolute highest level. I think it can be applicable to any level of football. So if you're interested in that, get over there, check it out in the courses. Now, it's not free. It isn't because it really is a lifetime of my football process. But I want more people to experience it, share it, enjoy it. I think it could help a lot of people. So if you're interested in what that looks like and how I created an offense, I think you're really going to love that course. So playbook specifically, I really, at the high school level, didn't want to use a playbook intentionally because I wanted things to be so simple that we wouldn't have to use a playbook so what that meant was that you'd have to have in-person classroom on the field teaching and really we did that the first year and did it at a pretty high level for a first year program running a new offense but when COVID hit and we just couldn't be around each other I essentially had to create a playbook and so I used just play as the software I think there are a number of different ways to be able to do it. You can probably find a way to do it for free. I prefer just play. They're not giving me anything to say that other than access to use it whenever for my own courses. But this idea being, it's a really simple, easy, clean way to be able to create images that I think uh, allow your players to learn well and quickly. Now you have to create them. They have templates, but you got to create it and it takes a hell of a long time and inevitably it will be too big, but issues with all or most playbooks. Uh, so what we're really going to talk about in this specific video is how to create a play calling sheet. Now, a few things to get out the way here. There are many ways to do this. In fact, there are no right ways to do this other than right for you, right for your system, your situation, your level of ball. I would say if you can keep the framework or the scaffolding to be as simple and clean for you or usable and not necessarily think of it as busy work because when you get to the highest of high levels these documents are really living documents and this they change constantly they change from walkthrough to practice from practice to meeting from film to the next day and so it's constantly evolving and changing i will say and from this point on it's really you know just my own personal experience anecdotally how i created my play sheet was that I wanted it to be really adaptive. I had no kind of overarching kind of ideology going into it going, hey, must be structured like this template. And I think that there are many free templates available online where you can go kind of get an idea of how play sheets are put together. I certainly brought a lot of experience 
from being able to see those and be in those meetings and understand how those things are put together. So I had an idea of how I wanted to do mine. But at the end of the day, I thought a lot of it was just wasted work because yeah, you need some of it. I don't necessarily think you need all of that all the time, specifically at lower levels. And so I wanted to make sure if I was going to do this and I was going to have to build the play sheet myself, I wanted it to be super usable, super easy to replicate week in and week out because things were going to you know, change game to game, those types of things. And so for me, it was easy to default to Excel. Now I think in Excel. So put that in kind of a lens as far as how you think, and you're thinking about creating your own play call sheet. You know, do you think in Word? Do you think in some other program? Do you think handwritten? Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I just think in Excel. I like using Excel. It's easy, you know, recovering pivot table type guy and so I can manage that well I like it and think it's easy to share on like Google Sheets to make available to other coaches and things like that and so that's where I started from now within that the actual columns you know and the and the information that's going in there really changed year to year because what we were as an offense changed year to year so it wasn't necessarily a static document but it wasn't kind of moving around concepts or little windows or rows all the time every single week because it's just a ridiculous amount of work and most people coaching at lower levels don't have you know a staff of assistants that you necessarily want to delegate that type of stuff or at least I didn't you know I was going to do it myself I was going to make it super usable that I could use it not only to call plays during the week in practice but I also wanted to give it to the quarterbacks give it to the skill players give it to people who wanted it share the information but also use it in the game to call plays. Like, how was I going to differentiate? You know, how many plays are you going to carry? How many, how are you going to construct them together? And so what we're going to do here is talk about kind of the final iteration of this. I've had, I coached high school football for three years calling plays. And each year, this play call sheet would have looked different. But this is the final year, what I think was kind of the most streamlined version of it. Now, the other part about it is it has to fit your system, your structure. We, I don't know, you know, y'all let me know if you think I'm crazy after you watch this video, but we carried what I would consider a high volume of plays for the high school level. Maybe you don't, maybe you can just, you know, air rate it and write it on a notepad and, and be fine. I couldn't, that's not how I operated. Now, in addition, I was calling plays from the sideline and signaling. And so I needed a way to kind of do all of that all in real time. And so... The other part about it that I think is important if you're talking about calling plays and tips is you really have to have your sideline procedure on lock and 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 talked out and planned and practiced really because we would practice this quite a bit. And on the sideline for us, I needed an, an assistant coach to essentially be the personnel director. This person communicate on the headphones, hey, uh, next series we're going, or next play we're going 12 personnel, next play we're going 10, next play we're going 21 and how to change if you have multiple 12 personnels. And we carried a high number of personnels because I thought it was advantageous to what we were as an offense. Some teams might only have 11. You know, some teams might, whatever. And so that was how we operated and that needed to be a real seamless thing and that was really a thankless job uh, for an assistant coach, but a really important job for what we did and how we operated in a kind of a pseudo up-tempo or had the capacity to be up-tempo whenever we wanted. So the sideline communication is really important but when you're talking about the play calling sheet, I needed to be able to find plays really quickly. So on the play calling sheet, there's a lot of little, you know, hints and indicators to make sure, hey, must call this. I like this play or things like that that are unique to me that might not necessarily make sense to someone else. And so to really my kind of like final piece of overarching advice is make it your own. Make the play calling sheet make sense to you. It's like a cheat sheet. You get to bring it to the test. You manage, might as well make it useful. And so the other part about it is to just make it as, you know, as easy as possible. I can't tell you how, you know, this is one of those things for me. This is how I call plays during the practice, usually during the practice week. It was constantly evolving, deleting, changing, those types of things that Excel allows you to do. But at the end of the day, if something was misspelled, I didn't care. You know, I wasn't freaking out. I didn't, no one else was going to look at this as detailed as I was going to look at it. And so that's just the reality of it. So now let's look at a few templates here. 
uh, not a few templates, the template that I used this past year to just get an idea. And then I will actually show you a game plan from the previous year of me coaching, actually the first game of that season. Now, some of it, a lot of it probably won't make sense to you, but it will give you a nice little window into the actual structure of what it looked like and how it looked for me. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to look that way for you, but you can see how I made it my own to allow me to be what I considered my best play calling self right out the gate. And so let's look at a few templates here. So this is just the clean template version. This is kind of the overarching normal game plan. And then we've got a little bit of the situational stuff over here. And so what are these columns? I'll pull it up, zoom in for us here. So that template was essentially going to allow me to be able to sort by personnel, by types of formation, that would be like two by two, three by one. Didn't really use that that much by concept. And then when we're actually calling the plays on the hashes. So when we're an up-tempo team, I needed to know kind of formation. What I wanted on the left hash would be opposite on the right hash. And I didn't want to necessarily have to do the mental gymnastics on the sideline. I just wanted it. Hey, if we're going to run, you know, duo out of some formation, I want it. What do we want it on the left hash? What do we want it on the right hash? If we have a middle to have it in the middle and just that's how my generic kind of good from anywhere plays were structured. Then the opposite side of that game plan was series openers. So on the back of the game plan, it would be series openers for me, which is a really important part, whole different video really about where I spent my time as a play caller. And then we got into situational football. Uh, I started our red area from the 40, but you can start it wherever the hell you want to start it. In addition, occasionally we would do fourth downs as well, just because we were going to go for it on third down almost all the time. So my third down calls were really fourth down calls, but really my third down calls were all the time calls. But you can see here, this is just how I broke it down. So here it is, kind of the overarching template. First game, 2021, for us it was against Mount Miguel, really good head coach, long time, great local head coach. Want to make sure we are locked in for this game. This is what it looked like front and back. Now I'm pretty sure, I don't know if I went legal or normal size paper, with this one, but what I would do is just go front and back. I would laminate it and put it on my hip with a little kind of like key card wire so I could let it go and it would just fall to my side. So we'll talk about exactly what this looks like, but you can see here, you know, I think in Excel, I categorize things a lot by color, put little specific emojis versus things I really liked and needed to get to, make sure I get to. We'll look at the detail of what this looks like, but this is front and back, kind of how it went as far as how I thought about it overall. You can see here, these are all the normal down and distance ones that I would want to get to. And then on the back, we would have kind of the situational. I've got the starters up top. I've got the red zone. I've got the fourth down. I've got some specials down here. I've got some notes for halftime. And this is just how it worked for me. Now, this might look like blinding color rush, but when you're on the sideline under the lights and you need to find something and all your pass plays are green, you can easily find what you need to look for. Or you're looking for a specific personnel, well, you need to make sure you know that your personnels are color-coded, or I needed to. So different ways to go about it. You can also see here, some of these plays are left hash only plays. There is no right hash option, different things like that. So now let's look at some detail here to see exactly what I'm talking about. So now this is a zoomed in version of what would be the top of kind of the generic from anywhere plays broken down by personnel. You can see the personnels on the left. You can see the formations. You can see the different concepts and then left hash, right hash. Again, the little emojis are little indicators for me what I really liked for the hearts. Uh, some of these other ones are signals that we use for different plays. You can see here just the greens were runs. The yellows were screens. The light greens look like passes here. Then whites are some drop back passes. So I did that for each personnel. So that was 11 personnel. Get into the 12 personnel. Again, at the bottom we've got some 11 and 12 that we like both. Got some 13, some 20, some 21, some 22, some zero, some one, some two, some 10. Again, a lot of plays that we really liked. It's a good problem to have. 
You can see the number of specials that we carried this first game. I think we actually started this game off with the special. We did that green heart tackled inside the five. Come on. We got different quarterback in there. Plays specifically for him. And then some up-tempo plays that we usually carried for each game that we really liked. So that was kind of the front page that I could get to in normal down and distance. Love all those plays. But you can see how they're kind of chunked together. Then this would be the backside. And again, same setup as far as personnel, formation, concept, hash, if I like it, hash, middle. But I spent a lot of time, and this is getting into the weeds weeds as far as how I think about offense, and specifically at the high school level, but how important series openers were for us. And so you can see here the different series openers that we carried. Just quickly here, go through exactly, see if I can tell you what all these are. Again, first play of the game. Uh, pin and pull, bash GT, play action shot down the field, split flow inside zone, uh, ins and comebacks on the outside, a little duo, RPO, unbalanced, pin and pull. This is an empty pass play. Pin and pull again out of a different personnel. Uh, RPO, power and hitches, straight up hitches, a uh, little Y cross with smash. And you can see here being really intentional with what those personnels are just because we probably were gonna stay in that personnel right out the gate for a couple plays. And then now we get into the red area. So I lied, I actually had to put one in from the 50 here. Double reverse pass, you know, just how you chunk it. Again, there's no reason to carry eight plays from the 40 to 31 because you're not gonna take eight shots. So just different ways to be able to do it. You know, this to me, if I was giving myself feedback, is too many plays for 30 to 31. But you can see here just as far as the thought process of what I was trying to do. And again, it's good to have a lot of plays that you really like. Again, 10 to 6, 20 to 11. And again, you can any way you can sort these things. And then at the end here, I had some fourth down plays for us just because our fourth down was really our third down. And that's about a wrap. And again, some of these fourth down, fourth and third to five, fourth and one to two could also carry as two-point plays. Then the back sheet, I used to put the official's name in there. I wanted to know who I was yelling at and just to make sure I leave some room for some sort of notes or something from the second half. So obviously make sure you're carrying a Sharpie around, those types of things. But for me, this is just how it was put together, how it worked for us. So hopefully that's a nice little insight, peek behind the curtain as far as how it worked for me creating a play calling sheet. I think that there really is no wrong way to do it as long as it makes sense to for you and allows you to operate as quickly as you want to operate as a play caller. The other thing that I would just bookend this thing with is to make sure you make it as adaptive as possible and being okay changing it as often as you need to change it. And then just be forgiving to yourself because there's going to be mistakes on there. I got over the fact in the league it was like it must be perfect, no misspellings, no anything can be wrong. Things are going to be wrong and it's okay. It's not the end of the world. In reality, it's probably not going to impact the game at all. And so just get over it. And maybe it was my own OCD elements of it. But I think once I did that, I started having a lot more fun with this thing and made it a lot more user-friendly and both creator-friendly. So if you're interested in more about this type of thing and really all of it, because I'll give you, when you enroll in the JTO course, the offensive framework, I give you every offensive game plan that I created at the high school level, give you every single note, get you every single cut up of film so you can really see kind of how I call plays, how we call plays, how we structure things, how we game plan things, how we put things together all through that course. And so if you're interested in that, uh, I'm excited to share it. I really do want more people to enroll in it and get a chance to operate within the system because I think the system is easy, allows you to carry a lot of volume, uh, allows you to operate at a really fast tempo if you want to and be multiple and adaptive and all those types of things that I think make great current offense kind of its absolute best self. So if you're interested in that, hop over there, check out the course. As for this one, really appreciate the question, Bryce. Well done. Keep the questions coming in. I appreciate you hanging to the end. I will see you next time. Have a good one.